stuck in the blue circle of death, waiting for a Celtic state of mind to go live. But here we are. <laughs> my name is Paul John Dykes. I am delighted to be joined by John Paul Mason. Wasn't my fault. It was Wi-Fi's fault. Who knows? But we're here. We're here and we're always here. JP, an absolute pleasure to join you on the Thursday Bulletin and loads to discuss. Absolutely loads to discuss. Tell me, first of all, where did you watch the game on Sunday? How did you enjoy the game? Um, I watched it with some friends at uh, Celtic Park in the North Stand Lounge. So they did like a, the Kerrydale Suite was sold out. So I saw that there was another option and then that sold out as well. But I managed to get four tickets for it. A pretty reasonable £15 included a pie. I mean, I think my mates thought it was going to include a pint as well, but no such luck. But I mean, it's one of those ones where it was either that or like queue for ages to get into a pub. Because that is in it, invariably what happens if you kind of if you kind of go to the game on a, a, a game like this. It's always massive queues. You need to be at the at the brazen for a good hour before kick off, and even then you're not guaranteed entry because they kind of favour regulars, which is absolutely fine. Um, but I know I watched it in, in, at Celtic Park, so it was kind of it kind of felt a bit comfortable to be going there. And I watched the the game when Carter Vickers scored the winner. At Celtic Park as well, so just it's not somewhere I've seen us lose. Uh, it's not it's not on my list of, and, it's, and it remains somewhere I've not seen us lose. So I'll, I'll I'll take that. You like a superstition, JP? You do like a superstition, um, as do I. But just when you were talking about the uh, the kind of changes, obviously in not attending the games, and we'll talk about that as well because people love to rewrite history as to why there's no Celtic fans at Ibrox, and we'll talk mm. about that. Um, surely there's an opportunity, JP, for a drive-in. Go in like the old movies. I know you've enjoyed things like Jaws going on the big screen. Who's doing that for the football? Anybody? How do you mean? Go into a big field, big massive screen, get the drink, get the food. Well, and saying that, did you see the footage of the beam back of the game, Atletico uh, Bilbao? The, uh, no. the cup, they, they screened the game, the, the cup final, because they won the Copa del Rey against Real Mallorca, and um, if their stadium was absolutely full for a beanbag, like a, like proper chocker bouncing, like a, like a concert. Aye, there's footage yeah. of it on, <clears throat> on Twitter. Somebody shared that it. it's absolutely incredible. Um, like four screens in the middle of the pitch, facing each stand, and uh, like giant jumbo screens. So it's pretty pretty cool to see that. So I, I mean, I don't know. I, mean, I guess you've got the security concerns. If we can't actually have our players safe on the park at the stadium, then uh, there'd obviously be policing and security concerns over some sort of outdoor and, and obviously weather right now for anyone watching outside of Scotland. It's not holiday weather in Scotland right now. It's absolutely grim. So It is. It is. Yeah. But, you know, you, you've touched on the, the security aspect, so let's kick off with this. Sorry, Jungle Line, I know um, late... No real, no really late in getting started, but just just late in getting the stream up. Uh, apologies, because <clears throat> I am juggling a wee bit with regards to thumbnails, and uh, I'm currently doing the social media promotion as I'm talking to JP. So um, they, they always tell us JP that we kind of do two things at once. So yeah, sorry about that, mate. And Magnet sixty seven afternoon action team, we are here and we are always here. Yes, you are waiting on me getting my finger out and getting a ring. Sorry. So. We'll talk about the safety concerns first because, as I say, right, and this really is a feature of Scottish football, um, the revisionism is frightening, JP, regarding why we are where we are with regards to the ticket allocation. So leading into this game a couple of weeks back, um, there was talk in the media around a, a new resolution to this being a 5% rule. That it's something that's been discussed previously. It would all, all, always give Celtic an upper hand in terms of, uh, sorry, I would give Rangers an upper hand in terms of how many tickets to get because our stadium is bigger, but 5% um, is what has been kind of floated. And then we go into that game and let's not forget why Celtic don't have tickets. The ticket allocation was uh, reduced massively to the point where we were getting about a tenth of what we used to get, JP. And uh, Bisgrove has said that uh, we're whilst he and the board and at Rangers, we will never go back to having the full broom one. It's just uh, no problem, mate. So 700 tickets, it didn't work. And it didn't work. And this was the Celt this was Celtic's official line because of fan experience and fan safety. 
and haven't spoken to I don't know, did you ever go into the 700? Did you ever get a ticket in there at Ibrox? No, no, like, just, I, like I said last week, I, I, until they made that decision recently, and even then, two and a half thousand, will I get a ticket for Ibrox? I, I doubt it. I mean, there they will be obviously high in demand. So, I mean, I've not been to Ibrox for six years. Mm-hmm. So. And, and and this is the thing, there's going to be a generation of Celtic fans who go to away games that won't enjoy the experience of beating Rangers in their own patch. And obviously, um, prior to the 700, um, it was it was reduced due to a number of factors, one of which being the hated seeing us celebrating behind the goals after yet another pumping, because we were beating them 5-1 and all that kind of stuff, JP. But also, they wanted to tap in to the selling potential of a number of those seats, sell them to season ticket holders, get the money in early so that they can plan their season, their season's finances. So the reason that Celtic refused was due to fan safety, mainly. And if you talk to someone like Declan McConville, who had been in there, um, it was it was you were taking your life into your own hands, you know, the amount of bottles and debris and missiles that was being thrown at Celtic supporters. You raised that. JP, as I have over the last couple of days, due to a blog that I wrote in relation to it. And you have Rangers fans coming back with, ah, but remember you hit Hugh Dallas with a coin. Five years ago. Someone even brought up the Mark Walters situation at Celtic Park, 1988, 36 yeah. years ago. The false equivalence of the argument that is presented to you is almost laughable, JP, if they didn't believe that that makes it look okay. Um, I know. 25 years going by doesn't doesn't uh, make it any better that, that you, Dallas, got hit with a coin by a Celtic fan. It doesn't make it any better. But three days going by or four days going by since Sunday doesn't make it any better that Matt O'Reilly had a glass bottle flung at him and coins were flung at the dugout and everything like that. I don't. I saw the replies to your to your post and I was just that just made me kind of. You obviously you think about jumping in and everything else, and you're like, "What?" Like, I've heard There's no hope. I've heard There's no hope. Morrison, I was listening to Huddle Breakdown, and Alan Morrison was just like, "I don't, I don't, don't engage with like one person on one particular thing. It just, it could end up taking hours out of your day. Life's short. <laughs> I mean, why would you seriously waste your time when you click on the the page of the person you're talking with, and they've got next to no audience, next to no credibility? Israel flags, Union Jacks all over the place, and you're just like, right, I'm out. <laughs> Mute, move on. I know, because, JP, you're right, uh, life is too short, especially when, r- with regards to negative energy, it's something that I really believe in, positive energy, and if you get stuck into that, it's like a tunnel that you're never going to tunnel out of, and then other like-minded people who actually believe the argument that it's an issue within both clubs, right, I'll just leave it out there. The evidence is out there for everyone to see, but we brought up the missiles at the, the weekend, JP. You've got a guy, the point I made with Matt O'Reilly is having scored the goal, and we'll talk about the Penenka, by the way, having scored the goal, a half bottle of Buckfast tonic wine was thrown in his direction. You can see it. And I, I'm not actually sure if anybody's seen it before the Celtic unique angle footage mm-hmm. was released. I mm-hmm. think that's the footage that I've seen the still from. Mm-hmm. Pretty close, pretty close to him, JP. I, I used an example from Murrayfield way back when, 20 odd year ago, where I seen somebody getting hit with a glass bottle that had been thrown, and the damage is it obliterates whoever it hits. You know, it's it's horrendous. Um, so the, the thought process for anyone to do that is just mind-boggling. Um, the person who threw the again bottle of work fast, which hit the physiotherapist, um, the last one of the last games at Ibrox, he was jailed for 12 months. He was jailed for 12 months for that offense. So you you are basically Taking, putting someone else's life at risk, but you're also, because it's permanent disfigurement, JP. You know what I mean? The guy's scarred for life. The physical- I mean, that totally, I, I, I know it's different and it's obviously a lot more in close quarters, but I came out at a nightclub one night in Edinburgh and it was two clubs coming out at the same time, so there was just a kind of mass of people all on Lothian Road. Um, I don't frequent <laughs> nightclubs on Lothian Road anymore, if there is any left. Um, but a guy got glassed right in front of me, um, like a forcible full pint in the face. And I heard the sound and saw it in the same second as it was in the corner of my eye. And I, it's one of the worst things I've ever seen. And ultimately, if, you, if you're if you throwing a glass bottle at a person on the pitch, 
what is your intention there? Do you just want to graze their ankle with that bottle or do you want to hit them in the head? The question's got to be asked there because some people would come back and be like, oh, I only hit his ankle. It was fine. You know, he's, he's, he, he, you know, he walked, he walked away, you know, he's fine. But the physio wasn't fine, was he? So permanently disfigured. It's, it's absolutely mental. And the fact that there's not been a statement from that football club about such a thing is abhorrent as far as I'm concerned. And if anybody's watching this of a blue persuasion and they're laughing or anything like that, then you need to have a serious look at yourself as a as a human being and a football fan. A, a member of society. JP, it, it does worry me at times because I know that people like to hide behind um, anonymous uh, avatars and pseudonyms online and all this kind of stuff, but these people actually walk among us. You know, you could be walking down the high street anywhere, any city in, in Scotland, and that type of person with that type of belief system in their head actually walk among you. And it, I, I find it actually quite worrying. It's quite worrying that they can believe that uh, that kind of act is acceptable when quite clearly it's not. Um, but the other thing that worried me a wee bit is we, we all know about the speculation surrounding Matt O'Reilly in January. He's spoken about it recently. Um, why would anybody want to play in Scottish football when that's the kind of thing that you're going to be faced with? And, and it's constant. The barrage, I mean, I think I listed, I don't know, six or seven different examples on the blog. I listed further examples on my responses. There's a dozen, at least, where people are unsafe when they go to Ibrox, be that pundits, coaches, um, other members of staff, i.e. physiotherapists, fans, players, referees. No one is safe. And it's like, yeah, you're right. Own it. Take ownership of it. Don't say, oh, but Hugh Dallas got hit with a coin. One of the other ones was, what about Rapid Vienna? (laughs) Rapid Vienna. (laughs) <laughs> for the jungle, you're thinking, really? No, this is a real-time issue that needs to be addressed, that needs to be accepted. You take responsibility for it. I, and I, I don't wish to do it. I, If it was a Celtic fan next to me who threw a bottle at a game, I would take serious issue with it. And I'm pretty sure people around about would as well because it, it's just not something you want associated with your club at all in any shape or form, any, throwing anything. Like, I know that they made light of the pie getting thrown at Shankland but that sets a, a kind of acceptable tone of, oh, you can throw things in the park. doesn't matter if it's a pie or a bottle or a lighter or a, a mobile phone. Or, it, it just, there should, I don't understand why it would be in anybody's mindset to fling something on the football pitch at, at a football player. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty sad. It is, because the Shankland affair, obviously, that was the same game where someone threw a bottle at yeah. Um, big, you know, it was like a Swiss Army knife bottle opener, you know, one of the ones with all the different things, all the compartments. Yeah. And you think to yourself, wow, at what point do you think that's all right when it when it lands in his neck, you know, yeah. um, a dart in the ankle, all that kind of stuff. That was the Mickey Weir story. He was playing for Hibs against Hearts at Tynecastle, and he was about to take a corner. Mm-hmm. And he felt this, like, heat. He was like, and, he's at, and he looked down, somebody had thrown a dart. Right arm, and it hit him in the... So we know that it's, you know, it has existed for many, many years, JP, but this is a real-time issue, and this is an issue that needs to be addressed by the authorities, by the club, but I wouldn't hold my breath over that one. Mm. Um, and by Celtic, because uh, Celtic have to stand up for, uh, you know, their staff and, their, and their, their fans as well. So on the subject of Matt O'Reilly then, coming in for a bit of stick here and there, JP, no, I don't think on Axon. I don't think he's been getting stick on Axon. I've seen it on the social media. Um, what a way to take a penalty um, at a packed Ibrox you know nerves of steel balls uh, of steel absolutely it won, it won me 50 quid as well because I was certain and I'm not just saying this with hindsight I wouldn't say it in advance because obviously uh, I don't like saying when you asked me for a prediction last week and you know, I could have sat here and went, oh, we'll win 3 0 or we'll win 2 0. Or, and it, I never like put that out, but I was so certain he was going to score at Ibrox that I, I put money on it. And I don't really bet that much, but I stuck a tenner on him at 5 to 1 um, to score. And uh, when, they, when we got the penalty, I mean, I, I don't know why he's not taking penalties. I'm not saying that he's going to penenka them every time, but like he's got a very composed nature about him. He's got a um, friend who's a life coach in India who who gives him um, spiritual guidance, if you want to call it that. Um, so when he was taking that penalty, I was just sitting there going, well, also, in the lead up to the penalty, 
if John Beaton hadn't given that penalty after looking at it on VAR, I think I might have spontaneously combusted. I'm, I'm not even kidding because having given the penalty at, at Tynecastle against the water, I mean, but I, I mean, obviously, you, you know, anybody with eyes can see the difference between those two incidents. If he hadn't given that penalty, I think there may have been a riot in the in the lounge, to be honest, because it, it, you, you couldn't comprehend that. So anyway, but when he steps up to take the penalty, I was just thinking, Zen, Zen. Think of some calm water somewhere and just dink it. I didn't think he was going to dink it in, but my goodness, what a what a what a finish and the celebration as well. Just this sort of smile, like a kind of smile of the fans. I mean, obviously, <laughs> it must be major. And quite rightly, um, th- th- does that allow them to fling a bottle of buck fast at them? No. No, you have to take your medicine. You have to take your medicine. It's as simple as that. I mean, they've scored against us at Celtic Park, in silence Celtic Park. Ryan Kent doing his, you know, gun celebration to the head. Uh, that was pretty much right in front of me. Or certainly it was into the goals that's nearest me. Um Horrible moments, and I, I know exactly how they feel. But I didn't have a glass bottle ready to fling at the player. So, um, but yeah, it was uh, it was cool, calm, and collected, and fully deserved going into half time. We could have been, it could have been more. No, you're right. And Matt O'Reilly again, as I say, going back to some of the stick he's been taking, JP. I think most of the time that you and I are on, we tend to stand up for him. I was talking about the uh, the effect of having interest from other clubs. We've seen it so often, haven't we, uh, with football players, where there's a bid or there's interest from a particular club and it's difficult for them to focus fully. Even though you you know you hear people saying they're a professional footballer, they get paid their wages, you know, they've got to play that at their optimum. But it's all about state of mind. And he's spoken about it. He's spoken about the fact that it did affect him in the first few games after uh, the January transfer window. I don't think it's affected him though insofar as he's not trying a leg for Celtic. No. I don't like this down in tools nonsense. I've never seen any of that from Matt O'Reilly. No, um, certainly not. And it, it, I actually read that article because it, um, it was one that piqued my interest just because it was like, all right, Matt O'Reilly has spoken about that situation. And it was it was interesting to hear the way that he spoke about it in that all of a sudden I'm this guy with a price tag on my head. And it suddenly probably felt m- m- more pressure because until a bid comes in, you're just it's just speculation, and you're just like you're playing really well, you're getting man in the matches in the Champions League, and um, you're being linked with people. But as soon, as soon as there's a figure next to your head, you're like, right, if I'm worth that money, or they think I'm worth that money, then I I need to play like that, and that's the pressure that you don't think about. Right, that's the flip side of the of the transfer interest is when suddenly the players aware of their value and. Th- their contribution to the team. So he, he's going to start thinking, oh, I need to score hat tricks every game, or I need, to, I need to completely and utterly dominate every single game. And that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself, especially when you're playing with a back four of Ralston, Burnaby, Scales, and Welsh. Um, I'm not being disrespectful, but that's what that's the that's the hand that we were playing with for some of those games. When you've not got that foundation at the back that's solid, you've not got people that have played hundreds of games of football. You've got people that have paid, not even played a hundred games of football. So yeah, that's the difference. And and see with regards to that as well, um, getting through the injury crisis that resulted in us fielding a defence or finishing a game with that defence, JP. I think that um, in terms of the time and going into that game at the weekend, people were talking about McGregor coming back, for example. There was a very good point raised a couple of weeks back um, when we realised that Hatati was maybe that wee bit ahead of McGregor. And the point was that um, even if McGregor is fit to be in the squad, don't play him because what you've got is a situation with Hatati is building himself up to match sharpness. You saw that near the 20, 20 minutes from the end of the game. He wasn't quite, you know, uh, running about and doing his usual because he's he was blown at his backside. Callum McGregor's not fit enough. Matt Riley's doing a lot of the legwork and he's doing a lot of legwork for other midfielders who are coming in who haven't played many games like Kawata. I think Bernardo seems to be okay in that respect, but I think he's done a lot of the work that has gone under the radar. I mean, I think even if you were to look at him against Rangers, I don't have the stats in front of me here, but you know the distance ran by each individual player. Mm. He's up there every week, isn't he? O'Reilly covers a lot of ground. 
Yeah, no, he definitely does. And and <clears throat> as we've said before, he he played twenty two games on the bounce in the full ninety minutes, not getting sub, not getting that fifteen minutes, twenty minutes out of your ninety could could make a lot of difference. I would imagine, no expert, I would imagine could make a lot of difference to your recovery time for the next game. So if you're playing ninety minutes and then you've got another game midweek or even if you've got another game in seven days, if you're getting that that sub that sub off, because you don't just stop in the last 15, 20 minutes of a game. There's been times where we've only been 1-0 up and you're still having to chase after the opposition who brought on subs who have fresh legs. And that, that last 15, 20 minutes can be taxing unless you're, you know, the cigars out and you're 4-5 to the good. Um, but that's not been the case for us. We, we've we as as was proved against Kilmarnock when uh, we we lost the late the late equaliser, which is at the moment definitely hamstringing us. That that result it was a game we should have won, definitely should have won. Um, but I the, the the Matt Riley thing, yeah, he has his stats. I would imagine are uh, higher than than most. You're talking about a, a situation against Kilmarnock there where we lost that that really late equaliser and we hope it doesn't come back to haunt us JP you hope that we've got enough in the tank between now and the end of the season to continually write our own story we've won games in the last minute Hibs Motherwell you know yeah. twice so but, but see the margins right again I brought this up yesterday those, those tiny tiny margins at times can be the difference between a win a loss winning a league whatever it may be and I I've got to the point where I think Brendan Rodgers has been sussing out a lot of the, the mentality um, around players who may be quite new in the building. And and I say that in relation to Burnaby. I know that he's been at the club now for, you would think, long enough. But I think that Brendan Rodgers has realised um, that there, there's something missing in a player like Burnaby in terms of the mentality whereby you do everything to make sure that boy doesn't get on the end of that cross. Everything. And you scrape the one nothing, and it's three points in the bag and we move on. And if you don't have that wee bit extra, you're not going to play in this team. And I think that that has also been evident, evidenced by the departure of Saeed Haksabanovic. I mentioned this yesterday through the attitudinal issues that he showed on social media. Gustav Lagerbelt kind of summoned, just he's gone. He's gone and then he's summoned back in the door when he's one, one foot is in Serie A. And the, the treatment of these players is so much, so far um, removed from what you would expect. However, sometimes it's necessary. So I think that if there's a player not in the squad, i.e. Lagerbjelk, Navroski, and Palmer, who seems to be falling into that bracket, it can sometimes fall into that that same bracket whereby they just don't they don't have the mentality for it. They don't have the mentality for this fight. And Rogers has seen it maybe at training, JP. So I, I'm I'm reluctant to question sometimes now why Welsh is on the bench and not Navroski because you think to yourself they've not yeah, got maybe they just don't have the mentality. This is for the greater good of Celtic than. I'm, I'm not shedding any tears or playing any tiny vi- or playing any large violins for any players that are only getting a game or are out of the picture or anything like that. I mean, Palmer was deemed fit and wasn't in the squad on Sunday, which, I mean, when Melly and I were at the Livingston game the week before, we were discussing Ibrox and he isn't a huge fan of James Forrest. I mean, he was like, oh, who would you have in the squad for Ibrox? Lewis Palmer or James Forrest? And I mean, I can't remember actually what I said. <laughs> I didn't listen back to it, but I would definitely have had Forrest in that squad for, for Ibrox over Lewis Palmer. Um, and I was obviously, you know, Harry Hindsight, I, I do wonder why Forrest wasn't wasn't introduced to that game um, as opposed to Yang. Mm-hmm. It's all it's all one, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it, we're not we're we're all experts after the after the affair, but um, that's a fair point, no, JP, because it's that mentality again that I'm going to go back to, right? And you know, in terms of ability, I have no doubt that Aksabanovic and Palma and Yang have all got bags of ability, but when it comes down to this this bit this bit of the the league title race, James E. Forrest, he might not be very fashionable, JP. But I tell you something, right? He would have got his body between, uh, you know, the, the winning goal and and Liam Scales. He right? probably would have made a better decision when Ida broke down the left and cut into the box, 
James Forrest yeah. positioning would have been better, I think, in that yeah. in that instance. It's all it's all ifs, buts and maybes, but ultimately I think James Forrest gets such a hard time and um and, and, and I think Melly said, Oh, when has he ever done it at Ibrox before? And I'm like, well, you don't really need someone to do it. You just need someone to do their job. And, it, and that doesn't necessarily mean scoring or assisting, it just means breaking the play up. Being yep. clear with the ball, winning fouls, if we were if we were likely to get any fouls. I mean, that's another story, the whole not getting a foul for the first 20 minutes. And you see some of the fouls that were given. And I said that at the time. I actually said and probably shouted it out loud. I was like, they're just picking the ball up and taking free kicks. They're refereeing their own game mm -hmm. um, before whistles are blown and stuff like that. And you're just like, the one in Goldson where he, t he turns and sort of just falls on the ground because he realises he's turned into trouble with Matt O'Reilly behind him. And he goes down and you're like, barely get touched here. You're, guy's like a, a six foot plus centre half and that's how he's going down. I mean, come on. No, you're right. And it was an interesting um, observation, again, that I saw on the old Celtic Twitter regarding the fact that Celtic did not, um, didn't get a foul in the first 20 minutes. And that that it's bonkers, JP, right? Especially when you look at the bulky possession that we had, etc. But it's it's sometimes these things that you know, if you look at the, the kind of baseline stats of penalties and red cards, that type of thing goes unnoticed. But that type of thing can really affect the outcome of a football game. And you're talking about Forrest there. If Forrest gets in front of Matondo, right, and he doesn't he doesn't strike that ball the way that he did. Great finish, by the way. Take nothing from the oh, first yeah. one. He had, a, he had a cracking, you know, view of it because mm. nobody was in front of him. If he does that, we don't even notice it, JP. <laughs> Just Matonda had, had the ball and he maybe lays it off to somebody. We don't even notice what James Forrest has done there, really. Mm. And we just move on. But the very fact that Yang didn't do it is concerning me. And I, I've mentioned some of the guys that have come in over the last couple of years who don't have the mentality to play for Celtic. And I'm not saying power yet because I don't know what the situation is. Lagerbilk would have been out the door if Carter Vickers wasn't injured in January. Um, and obviously you've got Haksabanovic, you've got Bernabe. These are the types of players that if you're not up to it in terms of the state of mind and the mentality, they are going to have to get shipped out. And I think Brendan Rodgers has marked their cards, to be honest. And I think that's one of the issues with Palmer. I was going on about him and his discipline. The fact that he kept picking up daft bookings. He's been booked so often this season. And a lot of the time, JP, it was just for nonsense offences. And the, the most recent one is when he scores a goal and he takes his top off. Now, I know... But he wants to make a gesture regarding his friend and all this kind of stuff, right? But you know you're taking a booking for that. And that's a lack of discipline. Mm. And I don't think we've seen him since. So if he's fit, if he's fit to play, mm. Rogers is maybe saying, right, I need somebody who isn't going to do that and get suspended for the Rangers game, let's say, at Celtic Park. Well, it's not even just suspensions. It's like you saw the way that the bookings early on affected the way that players played. Yeah, could. You know? I think could, yeah. Like the Johnston yellow card that he got for um, the supposed uh, grievous bodily harm on Fabio Silva was was so unnecessary and I, I don't even really know people will argue oh yeah it was the definite book and he obstructed them or whatever but it just seemed like they were both started to run at the same time and Johnson hesitated he hesitated and then he runs into him and then obviously the 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 following footage that's ensued has been shared widely on social media and I actually think it gets worse every time I see it where you see his, Silva's legs go up in the air and about 10 taps of the ground spitting out his chuggy for some reason um, it's one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen in my life I genuinely like a guy's a grown man like he could father children and he's behaving like that, that that's frightening <laughs> Um, and he's doing it on a football pitch in front of a full stadium of his own fans who, by and large, that I've heard and seen were disgusted with his behaviour. I mean, I genuinely wouldn't want him pulling on. If he was a Celtic player and he'd done that, I wouldn't want him pulling on a shirt again. And I'm not just saying that. I genuinely wouldn't. I wouldn't want someone like that playing for my football team because, I mean, heart of a mouse. <laughs> You're talking about a derby that's had some of the most mental tackles in it and... People have got up and got on with it. Um, it's just wild that he was he was allowed to do that and not get booked. I mean, that was a bookable offence. He's completely and utterly feigning injury. Um, 
Alistair Johnson gets the book, the booking, and then that's the booking that when it led to the penalty incident, they were all, all the Rangers players were surrounding, beating, saying get him off. So he would have been off the park for winning the ball in the penalty kick, in the penalty area, and slightly flicking his foot on uh, Silva's knee, not to the point that it was like vicious or anything like that. And then the first foul would be a yellow card that he got and look at Silva's reaction to that incident. Like That would have been his red card story for that game, which would have been an absolute travesty. Yeah. yeah. I mean, on on that note, though, the, the penalty kick that you're, you're um, bringing up here, uh, in real time watching it, JP, I thought it was a ludicrous decision. Absolutely ludicrous. And then what happens is for four days, you're seeing every single angle, at every single speed, and you're hearing everybody's opinions about it. So four days later, I've, I've slept on it, I've considered it, I've heard every single person's view on it, and I've not changed my mind. I still think it was a ludicrous decision. Because the way I, I watch it, right, and, and I know that you've got certain people who go to, <laughs> go to the uh, IFAB rules and, and where it suits them, and then they're still interpreting them in a certain way. You know, It's not as black and white as what they think. Because they can go onto a website, right, and then copy and paste a rule or a part of legislation doesn't make them the, the kind of brains of Britain or the authority on the discussion, JP. Because mm -hmm. once you read through it, it still doesn't answer your question. The first offence for me is a dive. You dive, mm -hmm. right? And if, if it's body movement of that dive, right, is one of the reasons why there's contact. He hits his knee. Aye, yeah, totally. It's one, no, it's I mean... one of the reasons why there's contact. And he hits his knee after hitting the ball. You know, yeah. if, everybody contact does not result in a penalty kick. Because if that's the way the game's going, the game is gone. You know, every single bit of contact in the box is not a penalty. But what I'm hearing is absolute contradictions when you then compare the Kyogo versus Livingston mm -hmm. incident. Was it made against Kilmarnock? We've had so many of these incidents where... Oh, they made, was it the one? No, remember it was the Hak Sabanovic. Hak Sabanovic, yeah. And the That's foot right. was put right on his ankle. Right in front of me, by the way. I was in that stand. That and we didn't get the penalty. <laughs> it was Hak Sabanovic, you're right. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, if you're going to run with that argument, of the silver ones are penalty. All these other ones that we are mentioning, there's two just off the top of your heads. They're penalties. And then it's a lack of consistency, or is it? Um, we've then heard yesterday the furore that uh, has been raised by Aberdeen in relation to VAR. And, and you say, right, this is... Obviously, we're focused on Celtic, JP. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Alan Morris and I focused an entire show on the officials and the decision-making process and the way that it can really affect negatively the outcome of games involving Celtic, or it can it can affect positively any game involving Rangers for that one team, and the patterns that existed were quite astonishing. And and you know, it's been watched something like and listened to something like thirty five thousand times that particular show, so people are interested. But we had other fans of other teams coming to us and going, "Look, this isn't a Celtic problem." Hibs fans were coming in and saying that, and we've now got Aberdeen saying, "Var, that's not fit for purpose." Listen, you're feeling our pain. Remember Fur Park, Jota, with the lines, mm -hmm. and the camera, the Hawkeye, and it was, you know, pointing somewhere else. This, this whole implementation of the system has been shambolic. And when the SFA were asked to review it, they came up with something like 96% on their paper. They gave themselves an A plus JP on how mm -hmm. this has been implemented and used. And that worries me because I, I've now heard other clubs saying we should um, remove our backing financially of this system because it's not good enough, it's no fit for purpose. Um, but I, again, I just think that you're backing, you're backing it at clouds when it comes to Scottish football at times. Well, with regards to the, the John Beaton, there's, there's been people talking about John Beaton, and John Beaton, who, by the way, was under immense pressure um, you know, the, uh, for that game. And you know, it was almost like, as I said before, a tiny violin getting played for John Beaton. John Beaton's put himself under that pressure with the decisions he made at Tynecastle, which were widely derided by everybody who watches football. There's never a penalty. He decided it was. There was never a red card. He decided it was. He's getting pictured in Dutch football tops. He's been in the Crown Bar in wherever it is, Bells Hill. Like, it's quite obvious what's happening here with regards to him. <laughs> there's no two ways about it. There's, there's Even the way that he spoke to a player when he was running to uh, give the penalty, he told somebody to shut up. You see like, that? Who, who the hell are you? We aren't players aren't allowed to talk to you like that. So why are you allowed to talk to 
I've sure. seen it at the time. I've seen it at the time. And it brought me back to the, the red card that he gave to Boyata. The way he spoke to Boyata that night, if you remember it. And the clip's out there. I think it's been shared in the last couple of days. And it's just that attitude where you're screaming at our players, JP, as if they are dirt on your shoe. Mm. And then when you're you're telling uh, James Tavian here just to, to hold on for a moment, it's Tav, as if they're all pally pally. And, and, and it's that approach that you're looking at thinking, you're doing yourself no favours here, Pam. So you're right. No. If you're under pressure, a lot of that, you're putting it on yourself. And and the, the penalty as well, I think Celtic are right to um, to question why the footage that was shown to him didn't include the touch in the ball. Now, I know people will go, not every, pen, not every time you touch the ball in the box, um, does that mean that you're not going to give away a penalty? But as a point, I was listening before I came in here uh, to the Breakfast of Champions, uh, trademarked uh, 20-minute Tims, and somebody had, on one of their shows had made a point of, if, if was it Lawrence that, that made, made the tackle on Iwata that got pulled back? Yeah, it was, I. See if he'd got a touch to the ball. Do you think they'd have brought it back for a foul? Absolutely not. That goal would have been given. 100%. And that 100%. is... Do you know, there you go. There's there's more kind of double standards. So, I don't know. It's it's frustrating. It's very very frustrating. I said that I didn't want anything last week to uh, to impinge on the game in terms of VAR decisions. Like I didn't want us to win with a dodgy penalty. We got a stonewall penalty given for us, which we scored. Maeda, as much as people are saying he's lucky with that goal. He made that goal happen. And and also, by the way, credit may or may not be given to Joe Hart for... I mean, you could just say that was just a get-it-up-the-park clearance. What if he actually knew what he was doing there? I'm not saying he did, but what if he actually did hit that ball with the intention of it going out uh, over to the to the left wing for Maeda to chase? Might well have been the case. You could ask him and he'd maybe laugh and go, ah, of course I did. And he maybe didn't he? But Maeda, as we've always said, and as I've always said, the work rate that that guy puts in, he makes his own luck. And he makes his own luck in that situation for, for, for my uh, liking. And it was an unbelievable start. And weirdly, Johnny Dock, the bass player from the Twilight Sad, texted me the day before and just went, I've just been at a kid's birthday party with this guy. And Johnny doesn't have any interest in football at all when he sends me a picture of Maeda. And I'm like, no way, man. <laughs> so like his wee, his wee girl must have been uh, at the same birthday party as Maeda's kids. And I should have saw that as the omen to to back Maeda to score the, score the first goal. But it wasn't actually that very good a price. Um, I, I did look at it. Um, you don't see anybody like that in the soft play areas of Dunfermline's um, choice. I, I, I've already put a trainer in Matt Riley, so I, 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 didn't, I didn't go for it. But yeah, it was um, it was quite mad. I texted him straight away and I was like, and he's just like, the last texts were our, were our conversation the day before about Maeda being at this birthday party with him. And Johnny was like, oh, I didn't know who he was, but he looked very fancy. So I thought he must be somebody. And I asked somebody who he is and he said, oh, that's Dyson Maeda, he plays for Celtic. And uh, so the next text message I sent was like, he's just scored after 21 seconds with about 10 exclamation marks. Um, That's yeah. understand. And see the thing, your point you make there about Joe Hart, I guess we'll never know. However, when you look at the experience of Joe Hart, and we've been talking about this, obviously, coming to the end of his career, um, and the fact that, you know, if we're talking about it on here, JP, as we have been in the last fortnight, to play Tavernier on his back foot, to get... Dyson made a running at him and all this kind of stuff. If it's that obvious to us, then Joe Hart will know that. And, and you know, he's in a scenario there where it's really early, obviously early in the game and, and the ball's played back to him, I think, for Carter Vickers, isn't it? And um, I wouldn't have put it past them to, to, to think, I'm just going to put it in that general area and, and see if my Maeda can get something on the end of it. But what I would say, though, what is definite is that last year Joe Hart wouldn't have done that. Seen the first no, minute of the game, he would mm. not have played that ball. And this mm. is the thing, and I'm not trying to give credit to Brendan Rodgers, and I'm not trying to detract from the impact of Ange Postecoglou, but last season, Joe Hart doesn't play that ball, JP. He would have taken a touch, he would have looked back at Carter Vickers, he would have played in Starfelt, and then we would have done our horseshoe thing to mm. keep possession. What, but, what I said before half-time as well, by the way, that was yeah. massive. Mm -hmm. to, 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 not, to not concede before half-time, obviously, the penalty happens and that's out of that's out of his hands, but I mean, what was in his hands was to save that shot from 
I mean, if, if Fabio Silva had got anything in that game, it would have been a, an absolute travesty given his, given his antics, um, which don't seem to have been condemned by his manager, by the way. Also quite weird. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe privately, I would hope privately that he's been pulled up about it because if you were to sit, if I was him and I was to sit in the manager's office with this supposed imposing figure that is Philip Clement, I, I, I wouldn't really relish you know, what should happen in that situation where you're shown footage of that and being like, really? <laughs> you know, to be a ranger and all that, Bill Struth, it's, it's not, no, it, no chance. It's um, a joke. It's an absolute joke, JP. And, and like you say, as a football fan, first and foremost, I would not entertain that. I would not want that play, playing for my football club. It was an embarrassment. He was an embarrassment. And, and it's then, also been compared to Kyogo, by the way. When have you ever yeah. seen Kyogo do that? I'm, but I'm this, sorry, this myth that's this been is built. That. Aye. This is a false equivalent, so JP. You can give them 20 examples of something that's happened in the last five months and they'll tell you that Gordon Strachan was attacked by a Celtic fan in 1984. Mm. And they think that that's a valid argument. It's abs- By the way, someone actually raised that. I mm. spoke to Gordon Strachan about that fan. You know he ended up going for a beer with him? No. The, right, so there's a Celtic fan, if you're watching, let us know, um, who ran onto the park to attack Gordon Strachan. When he was with Aberdeen. Yeah, I knew that happened. Yeah, and um, Strack was asked about it when he took the Celtic job. It was way back when, and he was asked about this question about, you know, you were a type of player that, that op- opposing fans love to hate because you were a thorn in their side, really. It was it was like a respectful thing, but running on the park and attacking him isn't he respectful. And no. he, t- he told the story about, oh, yeah, I, I, I met up with him. He wrote to me. He wrote to me. And this guy actually wrote to Gordon Strack and saying, that night, um, was the beginning of my life spiraling out of control. He ended up, you know, seriously, his life spiraled out of control after that. Um, he was in the papers for all the wrong reasons, lost his job, ended up alcohol problems and all the rest of it. Gordon Strachan met him. He actually went and met him and uh, everything was cool. But that was the example that was given to me with regards to the issues that, that clearly exist uh, when it comes to Celtic or anybody asso- associated with the club going to the stadium to try and do their job. Um, and you hope that as well as reporting the incidents individually to Police Scotland, as Celtic have done, you hope that there's discussions happening behind the scenes as well, JP, regarding the fact that we're not safe. We're not safe at that stadium, especially if we're getting a, a higher allocation next season. Mm, aye, well, I mean, what is it, two and a half thousand or something? I, you'd like to think that it's a bit more safety in numbers in that respect, but I mean, who, who knows? It's uh, it's just it's, it's a strange situation that what made them suddenly decide to cut it? From, and I know they'll argue against the fact that it was celebrations, but what made them suddenly decide to cut it from 7,000 to 700? Why didn't they do that years ago? Like, what, 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 did, they, did they genuinely suddenly need that money so much and see that opportunity to make more money? Or was it a an opportunity to, to, to dilute dilute the atmosphere at Ibrox. Um, it's, it was still, even when they got that goal chopped off, it was still weird because, like, you heard cheers and you're like, what are they cheering for? They think the goal's been given. Yeah. But not, you're thinking those cheers are Celtic fans. And you're like, well, there's no Celtic fans there. Um, but then that's the second time that's happened that they've cheered a goal that has been chopped off. Um, Admittedly, John Beaton confused that a little by pointing. I'm not sure where you're supposed to point, but you're supposed to point to the halfway line. But he was pointing to the halfway line, and then he went like that. If that is the universal sign for... They're cheering. They're cheering because they think it's a foregone conclusion, JP. They're so used to getting the decision. So, you know, that's why. But talking about cheering, when Silva goes down in the box, and by the way, um, Tony Cassidy, AJ did get a touch on the ball, and this is the issue. And, and I'm, not, I'm not standing up for Beaton here, but this is the issue. When Beaton goes to look at it, he's not shown that bit. And and so you're throwing doubt into the scenario that there doesn't have to be any doubt. If he's shown the full run of footage, JP, and he sees what he actually saw at the time, for me, that's going to confirm what he saw at the time. It's going to confirm, you know, that the moment that he was in, rather than, and he needs to be brave in that scenario, but they've, they've not shown them the full footage. And, of course, that's why Celtic have, have raised co- uh, a complaint with the SFA. Because yeah. the use of our, it's the use of our. I mean, obviously, Silva's bought it. I mean, he, 
he's felt the minimal contact that he's felt from uh, Alistair Johnston, who's off balance and fallen. His leg kind of goes up in a weird way. I, I, I genuinely think if you sat Alistair Johnston down and said, were you trying to foul him there? He'd be like, no, because I've won the ball. Like, as soon as he's got that toe at the ball, he's probably in his head thinking, I've won the ball. What happens now is irrelevant. But it wasn't because his foot was, because he was off balance, his foot's gone high up and, and touched the knee. But Silva's already going down, <laughs> anticipating more contact. He's got the contact that he needed to be able to shout for a penalty. And given his histrionics in the rest of the game, it's no real surprise that he's clearly, you know, looking for stuff. And I suppose the more the more the, the way you look at it and the way it's shown, it kind of does look like a penalty. But I point to the reaction of the fans who had the perfect view of it yep. right behind the goal. And most well, all of them that you could see in that shot of the still are all going. They're not going. <sighs> they're exactly. going. Exactly. I know. They and know. they've got the best view. They've got the exact best view. They've not. I don't know how you could have a better view than those people right there. It's not in the middle of the park. It's right in front of them. So I've got a question for you, JP, right? Let, let's cast our minds back to a tackle in one of these games that resulted in memes, T-shirts and graphics and everything else. Joso Simunovic versus Kenny Miller. So Joso wins the ball. Alistair Johnson won the ball. Jos Joso then goes through the player. Mm -hmm. Alistair Johnson then contacted the player's knee with his foot. Mm -hmm. If Joshua Zivmunovic or a Celtic player was to do that, well, Joshua will not do it because he doesn't play. But if a Celtic player was to do that now, in the box, against Rangers, what would happen? I would definitely go to VAR. It's one of the best tackles I've ever seen. Mm. One of the cleanest tackles, strong, mm -hmm. but surely we can't play a game of football now, JP, where there is no strength and aggression in the tackle. Mm. That, that was one of the best tackles I have ever seen. And I know it's become something of a, a meme I and all the rest of it. But the best yeah, one is where great tackle. The best one is the video where he slides in and uh, kicks, and then obviously Kenny Miller goes up in the air, and then someone's cut it to like Kenny Miller like spinning through the galaxy with that kind of <laughs> mad music. That's that's my personal favorite. I'll try and find oh, that. I know. I just I, I take my hat. I tip my hat to anybody that can do that kind of stuff because I mean they must have a lot of time in their hands, but yeah, the creativity behind it. But I go back to it, JP. That 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 was a fair tackle, a very hard tackle, and the kind of tackle that if you've got fans on the ground, it gets everybody, you know, it gives you all a lift. It was one of the ones I was thinking about when I was talking about previous incidents in games against Rangers, and then you compare it to like Fabio Silva rolling around. I know, and... I know, it's... I know. But let us know in the comments if that was to happen now. I say in the modern day, that was in the modern day. If it now happens within the world of VAR. Does Fumunovic get sent off? Does Rain do Rangers win win the foul? I'm going to say they probably do now. We've tied ourselves in knots with us, JP. Mm. You know, we've painted ourselves into a corner. I, I couldn't see that kind of tackle happening now in Scottish football without the Celtic player being penalised. And that's sad mm. for me because it was a it was an amazing tackle, a brilliant mm. tackle. It was brave, it was aggressive, it was everything you want from your defender. So if, if Carter Vickers was to do that in the next game at Celtic Park, what's the outcome? Mm. What is the outcome? Because I don't think it would be favourable in relation to Celtic. Now, um, we've got David Gillespie on the YouTube. Thanks, everybody, for getting in touch. Some nice wee Celtic tops behind you there, David. Are you in a hot tub? Yes, it looks as though you are with a Celtic top on. JP's not in a hot tub, but he's got Eric Cantona behind he him. He doesn't need to tackle. He just needs to, like, defend. Like, it's about positioning. You're right. I, I mean, Yang was sold a dummy. This isn't... Uh, I have a, have a go at Yang Day, by the way, right? Because I thought Yang was coming at the good form when he got sent off at Timecastle. And at that point, he's my first choice right winger. He's missed a few games and Kuhn has played well. I don't think Kuhn played well against Rangers, but Kuhn has played well and kept the jersey. But what I, all I want from Yang, right, is I just want his positional play to be better. He was sold so, so easily. And in fact, the body movement in Matondo, all right, it was just a shimmy, JP. But Yang moved about three yards to the right, which created the gap. And from that gap, he had a clear shot at goal. Carbon copy of the goal he scores against Hibs. Liam Scales naturally turns his head. I've seen people try to blame him. I can't see any blame on Scales. Joe Hart's no saving it. It's a great goal. But if your body's in front of him, 
He's not got the opportunity. So it's not even a tackle. Just It's all about up here, having the positional play and making sure that for the next three or four minutes, give them nothing, not an inch. Seriously, Tony Ralston would have done it. Mm -hmm. Tony Ralston would have done it. You know, he'd have got his body in the way. I know he's a different position, but he'd have got his body in the way. Tony McCann, JP, not enough has been made of that silver reaction. Absolute childlike. Well, thankfully, JP's brought it up today, and I agree with you. Um, I don't I, I don't want players like that in my football club. Um, but they'll probably laud him. They'll probably, you know, demand that the club buy him for 12 million. What would, what would, Eric, what would Eric Cantona have done to that guy? Put it that way. I mean, the guy wouldn't Let's, be... Let's talk about Cantona, right? Because people might say, be saying, why is he up there? Well, I'll tell you something. Well, I'm sure they have. I'm sure they have. Here's the going, this is a Celtic state of mind. Why has he got a Cantona strip up? Here's Eric the Cantona has been a gig in Glasgow tomorrow night. So there you go. Music, football. Cantona is playing a gig in Glasgow tonight. Yep. Not only that, well, right? There's a great picture. And I don't know. Someone out there that does T-shirts might have had it on a T-shirt. There's a great image of Eric Cantona wearing a Celtic strip. Testimonial. Mark Hughes. Yeah, I think so. Your pal. Our old pal Sparky. <laughs> After the Mark Hughes testimonial, there's a picture. There's actually a picture of him, Dion Dublin, Lee Sharp, and I think Ryan yeah. Giggs. I um, love Lee Sharp. Lee Sharp is in. such a great player. That guy in Barcelona when he did the Elvis celebration at the corner flag. I mean, he got the corner flag and yep. did the... Oh, I think Fer Fergie gave him a hard time for that. That was three each, actually, as well, the Barcelona. Oh, a sensational game. Barcelona man, yeah. But Cantona has donned the hoops, and he's the type of player I would have loved to have seen him playing for Celtic. What a sensational player he was. But yeah, JP, it is one of these kind of surreal things that I learn generally through your good self about, you know, Marseille Champions League winners playing at King Tut's and an Oasis. An Oasis bad. <laughs> and Eric Cantona, right, so he is playing in Glasgow tonight, JP. Tomorrow. What what's he doing to tomorrow? tomorrow. Yeah. What's he doing? Is it spoken word? Is he singing? What's he doing? No, it's kind of like Leonard Cohen sort of style music with like a full band. So I think there's when it was announced, I think there's a lot of confusion over. I don't. I, I was aware that he'd played a gig in London maybe last year or something, um, at a theatre in London which was sold out, and that was kind of like his first UK performance with this band. And um, there's a full live album on on Spotify that you can listen to, to what it is, but it may not be the best music that's going to like stand the test of time, but the idea of seeing a guy that, I mean, I absolutely idolised him. I mean, for me in my life, it's Celtic, Henrik Larsson, Manchester United, Eric Cantona. That is as uh, cut and dried as that. I loved them when I was a wee guy and absolutely idolised him. I used to play fives on at Bathgate Sports Centre on a Saturday morning, Cantona top on, colour up. Uh, every time I scored a goal, I was just imagining being Eric Cantona. Um, funnily enough, we didn't in the in the in the early to mid nineties, we didn't really have players of that level at Celtic. It was a simple fact, you know. So Manchester United was my uh, team as I was born in Manchester. So Manchester United. So the, 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 he was just like this. I mean, there was one season where he. Pretty much single handedly won Man United the league. Like there was, you could look at the scores and it's like 1 0 Cantona, 1 0 Cantona. And then the goal that he scored after they came back after um, the Kung Fu incident um, at Crystal Palace, I think it was. That dink that he scored is one of my favourite goals of all time. Like, and, the, cel and the celebration. Oh, the celebration when he just turns around, puffing the chest out. And then that, that, that night, I had a very, very random night one night uh, with uh, being out with Brian McClare um, after a gig. It was at, We were both at John Cooper Clark and um, he was in the dressing room afterwards, as was I, because I knew the support pretty well. The guy, Mike Gary, who's a great um, poet, um, check out his song as well, An Ode to Anthony H. Wilson, if you've not heard it. He, he uses um, Your Silent Face by New Order and then he does like an A to Z of... Tony Wilson in Manchester. It's absolutely brilliant. So he supports John Cooper Clark quite a lot. And yeah, we ended up uh, out for a drink. And I'm sitting talking to Brian McClare, which blew my mind. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe I was old enough or young enough at the time to remember Brian McClare playing for Man United. And I, I went home that night after uh, after speaking to him for an hour or two. 
I mean, I sat up till five in the morning just watching Brian McLear like stuff on YouTube and goals, assists. There's one where he assists Eric Cantona, I guess away in Norwich or no, Cantona assists him away in Norwich and I was just like he he played with Eric Cantona. I was like talking to somebody that played with Eric Cantona and then Cantona's playing a gig at the garage tomorrow night. It's just absolutely yeah. surreal. And Jockey will probably be there. Well, um, you said that, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Check out the interviews with Dummy Brian McClare because he talks about Cantona and Beckham and all the other guys that he played alongside, as well as his love for Tommy Burns and everything that happened at Celtic. And they're on the YouTube channel. Um, one of my favourite excels, by McClare. He, the guy's an absolute gem. And he talks about these guys like they're just just Eric, you know. Couldn't he paint? Uh, used to go on about being a painter, this French painter, this cultured guy. JP goes, it was all painting by numbers. His paintings were rubbish, you know. That's the kind of stuff you get for Chalky. He wasn't, like, he didn't get the glitz and all that. But there's a great bit of footage. Of Brian McClear playing for Manchester United against Leeds. And the ball goes to the touchline, goes out for a throw-in. I think it was, um, who was a big guy? I can't remember his name. It was in that team that, that won the league and all the rest of it, for Leeds I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And and McClear comes together on the kind of sidelines and then it goes out for a throw-in. And the camera's just kind of staying there and it starts to pan along. And who's sitting in the front row? John Squire and Manny at Old Trafford, right? And and years later, Manny and, and Chalky are like really tight. They're really good pals. And I love all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yes, go out and check Cantona tomorrow night at the garage. I, yep. I don't even believe I'm saying that. That's unbelievable. Well, McMillan, maybe we should book him for a gig. Their fans' faces when he dived in the box says it all. JP, I've not actually looked at the angle where you could maybe see the players. What was the players' reaction? Initially, in did terms any of them claim for it, did any of them claim for a penalty? Uh, I'm pretty sure Silva straight away was at the ref, and maybe was at Alistair Johnson. I, I can't, I can't really imagine. I just remember focusing on the on the on the fans, and then it all happened very quick. Well, we got booked straight away, and I think he was remonstrating about the fact that he'd been booked. Um, I mean, how it took till that minute for him to get booked is beyond me, but. Mm -hmm. um, Seemingly, you kind of get booked for histrionics and diving and you know, let's call it what it is, it's cheating. <laughs> that was a deliberate attempt to get Alistair Johnson sent off. But yep. the problem is, is I don't know how you could, in this day and age, not realise that everything's filmed, everything's been watched by a secondary referee. Like, when you watch that incident back and it's the... It's such a non-event of an incident in terms of it's not as if Alistair Johnson sticks the head on him or elbows him or punches him or anything like that. It's just a coming together that happens yeah. all the time in games. Mm -hmm. And 99% of the time, people get up and get on with it because they're, you know, adults. <laughs> um, How could you respect a fellow pro? Like even in the dressing room and, and at training, JP, if this guy, he's in on loan, he's on big wages... And he's behaving like that. I mean, he's still a fellow pro. And you surely, think he's he's team, surely his teammates, either publicly with him or behind his back on like a WhatsApp group, are like, go and check the neck of him. I know. <laughs> like, really? this, is, this is who we are playing with. This is a guy that we are playing with. Unforgiving. The, the dressing room of a, a professional football team, very unforgiving. You've heard all the stories. I don't I don't think they would tolerate it. It's, it's pathetic behaviour. Durban, uh, culture, welcome back to the show. Always great to see you. You only need to see the reaction of the Rangers fans behind the goal to know it was a dive. That was the point raised by JP. Ten goals and nine assists. Palmer would have been better than Yang. Why is he not in the squad, Daniel? Is my theory correct? Is, I Brennan, should, is, he, on the, is he on the naughty step, JP? Maybe? I don't know if it was based on that booking that you mentioned. I just, I just, I just wonder if he's got the... I mean, clearly Yang didn't have the... I mean, Throwing Yang into into that atmosphere at Ibrox when he hasn't really pro proven himself, like I, he didn't deserve to get red carded at Tenka, so I I totally will stand by that until <laughs> my dying day. Um, but he he didn't handle that as, as much as it wasn't his fault. He didn't handle that atmosphere, and he was sent off. Even although it wasn't the atmosphere, well, it kind of was. I mean, the crowd obviously went ballistic because they were wanting a, a red card and they got one, um, even though it wasn't. But Ibrox is 
it's, it's what I said last week, and, and you mentioned about Kuhn not playing well against Rangers. I think the early booking definitely hampered Kuhn in terms of his efforts for the rest of the game because it's not all about going forward and step overs and dinked crosses and everything else. There's the, there's the dirty work as well that you need to do as a winger and and being on a booking so early on in that atmosphere, it, 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 you're walking a tightrope as what four players were after. Yeah. Um, it was a we all got booked. Carter Vickers, Matt O'Reilly, Coon, yeah, Johnson and Coon. Mm-hmm. I know. <laughs> uh, aye, it is, and, it, and it, it hinders. You're right. It's it, kind of small things, but you know when you when you accumulate them, JP, it hinders the overall performance of your team. You've got two mm-hmm. defenders there on a booking. You know that that affects the the rest of their game, the rest of their performance, the decision making that they. You know you're not going to see Carter Vickers doing a, a Jojo Simunovic after getting booked. Because you no. don't want you don't want to ask the ref the question, and because the more way, often than not, you know the answer. A, a very good point was made, uh, albeit maybe accidentally, by a fan of them somewhere within the uh, the the the, <laughs> the noise of the last four or five days. I saw a comment or heard a comment where it was just like, "Where was the fight from our team? We didn't even get any bookings, as in Rangers." So mm. we, we, like they're basically saying we didn't get any bookings, which shows that we didn't have the passion. Now, obviously, the other side of that would be, well, you didn't get any bookings because the referee decided not to give you any bookings, not because yeah. you didn't deserve any. Um, so, aye, that was just a point that came to mind. No, you're right. And um, again, it's something that the club has raised. You hope that um, something can be done, but it's an ongoing issue. And my concern is between now and the end of the season, is there going to be other decisions that um, lose your point? Celtic, of course, coming up um, for their next fixture against St Mirren. That's well, happening on Saturday. I was, going to, I was going to say that. I, I was coming on here today expecting to either be still two points ahead or... Uh, <laughs> or well, wait a minute. We're, we're, a point, we're two points ahead now? No, we're a point ahead now. We're so a point ahead, yeah. I, I was expecting to either be a point ahead, two points behind or level. That was the that was the options that were coming into today, and as it stands, the game didn't happen again. Uh, obviously, if we were in that situation, I would be annoyed. I don't. I, oh, very nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Fife later on, so uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully. What are you doing in Fife, JP? I have reasons you, to. Yeah, you, you're, you're entering the kingdom. I am. Yeah. Um, um, um. So yeah. I, what was I saying? I the, the, the points thing. If it was us, that was in that situation. Yes, I'd be raging. Yes, it's an absolute farce that Dundee's pitch is in the state that it's in when seemingly every other football pitch in the country seems to be playable on. But um, but everyone talks about the 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 game at Celtic Park against them. Our most important game Saturday. We have to take care of the game on Saturday, and then if we do that, that's the first step towards winning these six games that. Obviously, we all want to, to do, but I, I do have a feeling that there's going to be points dropped elsewhere by both clubs. And we've already seen it in the same weekend. They lost at home at Motherwell and we lost away to, to Hearts. Um, things can happen to affect games, as we saw uh, mm-hmm. on Sunday, as we saw at Tynecastle. The, there is no trust in the VAR system uh, for me after Tynecastle. Uh, I don't have any trust in it. Um, yes, of course, we got a penalty on, on Sunday, thanks to VR, because that would have been missed. Yes, of course, we got a goal chopped off uh, that would have uh, benefited them because of VAR. A, a, a foul, by the way, that wasn't... Get, he gave all the other fouls that he, he gave for Cel- against Celtic and didn't give a foul that was right in front of him, that was clear yeah. as day, and had to rely on VAR to get him out of jail for that. That, that's wild. So that was a ridiculous. Bit I, of I, in that respect, I don't have any faith in the system for the upcoming games, be it against Rangers or Kilmarnock or anybody else. But the I'm one, gonna, team- I'm going to say something here. I think we need to score three goals. I, I, I said it going into the Rangers game. I actually said we need to score three goals to get two. I mm-hmm. think in order for us to get maximum points from a game at the minute, mm-hmm. I'm not confident unless we score three goals, JP and. Part of that is down to the fact that we've, we've been shipping daft goals ourselves. I mean, we mentioned the Bernabe one. There's been loads this season. But the other part of me is because very easily, um, at some point during the game, the referee, or VAR, 
can give the the opponent a seventy nine percent chance of scoring a goal by by giving them a penalty because that's what they're doing. They're saying right, there's a penalty, seventy nine percent chance of scoring a goal here, and they take it. Um, and and the sending offs obviously a massive a massive one as well, JP, because you're maybe looking at a game like Sunday, thinking right, there's not going to be anything like really dirty in terms of a, a straight red. But if I give Carter Vickers a yellow and I give Johnson a yellow, you know, 75, 80 minutes when people are getting tired mm. and there's a flailing leg, double yellow and you're off. That's the kind of thing that concerns me. And I'm now going into these last six games thinking we need to score three goals in every game. Mm-hmm. I've got no I mean, confidence in the rest and no confidence in the bar. We need, like you said, we need to make the story about us. And if, there's, if our story is scoring two or three goals, then we'll be fine. Um, but yeah, Saturday's massive. Really looking forward to it. Hope hope that the nerves aren't there. Hope everybody's in a good frame of mind going at the game. There's been games at Celtic Park this season when it's not been good. <laughs> and I uh, despaired that people booing at half time and all the rest of it. Like, we were nil nil at half time against Livingston, um, and and people were comfortable. A f- free stands at Ammon Vale, or whatever it's called now. I think they've just signed a deal with a taxi firm or something. Um, so um, everybody, I think everybody just has to be calm and trust in the team because that's what that's what happened at, at Ammon Vale. I, I wasn't sitting there at half time at Livingston thinking we weren't going to win. I was pretty confident that we were going to uh, do the job in the second half and we did so by the same token if, if we're now now at half time against the I really hope we're not I hope we're a, a goal or two to the good but I just think that there has to be a kind of acceptance that you, you've seen the team do damage in recent weeks and you, you trust in the, trust in the manager and trust in the team Trust in the quality. No, you're right. <clears throat> and again, it'll, it'll be interesting to see if Callum McGregor starts or if he gets another half out to try and help him through his mm. uh, recuperation to match sharpness. Thank you for to David Brennan for supporting the channel and to Feed the Bear for supporting a Celtic state of mind. We have been going live to at this moment in time, 1,500 live on the stream. Thanks, everybody, for continually coming at 12.30 to talk about Celtic for an hour every day. And then, obviously, for the match days, we're here half an hour before kickoff every game. Uh, regardless of the weather, uh, if it's midweek, if it's at the weekend, we are here, and um, we're also at bad couple of weeks. Um, I think there's 19 tickets left for the Mark O'Neill gig at Barra's Art and Design. Two weeks tonight, we have loads of entertainment as well as the QA and a with Martin, which in itself, JP, I find myself sometimes in these situations on a stage just sitting, zoning out and listening, right? And then having to remind myself, oh, wait a minute, I, I maybe have to get my next question set, set up in my head here because I just get engrossed with the story. He's a great storyteller. Mm. Um, and you'll remember, obviously, that night uh, bad. And before you know it, there's there's um, red wine flowing in the backstage area and there's Las Vegas having a wee chin wag with absolutely surreal. There's my big name drops. So Martin O'Neill is going to be on the stage with myself for 45 minutes. We then have um, a musician, David McKendrick, is going to come on to entertain the crowd at the halftime break. And then in the second half, the crowd ask the questions. Um, and we also use a lot of video footage now on the big screens just to remind you some of the successes under Martin O'Neill. Um, so it's going to be a great night. I cannot wait. And hopefully... You get, you get that clip of him uh, tearing uh, Robbie Williams. Or th- or, or, <laughs> that, that the one that's, you know, on the commentary team. Or... That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Robbie's sitting there in England top on. He's got yeah. for somebody that can't dance, can't sing, can't write songs. You've done all right, Robbie. Yeah, that was yeah. absolutely. And then he, I think he tries to backtrack and say, but that Angel song was okay. That was quite a decent song. Eh? Right, he actually um, did it right, by the way. You know the story behind that? Um, who was it that co wrote it with him? It was. He met an Irish guy out on the Lash in Dublin. It. And I watched they, a documentary about this. And they wrote it together. They, they yeah. went back to his apartment or something and wrote The, the Guts of Angels. And then he didn't hear from the guy again. He just sort of went on his own way, then met up with Guy Chambers and wrote Angels based around what they wrote together. And then the guy got wind of it and he paid him off. He paid him some paltry fee and the guy took it. And you're just like, oh my God, what? I mean, seriously, I think it was like seven grand or something. It was, it was something awful like that. I mean, you obviously can look. That is, I have watched something in relation to that guy. Um, 
and it was a, a kind of like mini doc. Yeah, there you go. Robbie Williams, Martin O'Neill had his number, um, and he will be with us. At 350, by the way, at Bad. So it's a cracking night in amongst the Celtic supporters. And if you want to come along, as I say, 19 tickets at the last count, come along, join the team. Really, really enjoyable nights. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. We will be back tomorrow at 12.30. All that's left for me to say, J.P. Mason, thank you for joining me on the Celtic State of Mind. Cheers, Paul.